I was surprised when Kira told me I could have her tickets. She had won them fair and square from the local radio, and I'd been green with envy since that day. And she knew it. It wasn't exactly a well-hidden secret that Cindy and I were very much into horror stuff. At lunch, we often talked about the latest horror movies and exchanged reviews about them. I knew Kira also liked horror, but she never really joined our conversations that much. Maybe she didn't want to be labeled as a horror freak, but Cindy and I never cared much about that. There's nothing wrong with the healthy dose of scary, right? Anyway, it wasn't really the tickets to the hyper-realistic haunted house in the woods that surprised me, but the fact that Kira was offering them to me. Cindy and I had been watching the news and knew that only a select 20 people would be invited to it this year. Getting a ticket was like winning the lottery, and people from all over the country were trying several contests to get access. It was the kind of event that you couldn't just buy yourself in. So, when Kira announced she had won a pair of tickets, I was super jealous. I'd been following the Haunted House Facebook page for months, hoping that I'd find a way to get in the first batch. The pictures they posted in there were fantastic, and I just knew the moment I saw them, I needed to experience it. It just looked so gory, so unabashedly grotesque that the horror lover in me was salivating at the prospect of visiting this latest and greatest attraction. And so when Kira offered me the tickets, she didn't need to offer them twice. She gave me some excuse about having to babysit her nephew on Halloween night, but the moment she said, I have these tickets, I was already sold. It surprised me, mostly because, well, a few weeks ago, I stole her lunch from the refrigerator at work, and she had been mad at me since then. I mean, okay, I know stealing a co-worker's lunch is a pretty shitty thing to do, but it was a super busy day at work. I couldn't really leave my seat to fetch myself lunch from the cafeteria downstairs. I had clients and supplier calls to deal with all day, as well as an impressive pile of numbers to crunch by 5 o'clock if I wanted to go back home at a reasonable hour. Basically, it was hell in the office, and I knew I wouldn't have time, so well, I kind of just stole the first lunch I saw. It was some kind of weird Olive Garden pasta salad in a red sauce. I couldn't even finish it because the taste was too strange for me. I wondered how long it had been in the refrigerator, or if it was even expired. Anyway, she saw half the Tupperware on my desk and scowled at me and hadn't talked to me much since then. Now I guessed that her giving me the tickets was her way to bury the hatchet or something. I wasn't going to question it, and I didn't want to change her mind. Though, I thought an apology was in order. So when she gave me the tickets, I told her I was sorry for eating her lunch that day. She gestured emptily and told me it was all in the past, all forgotten, and understood I only did it because I was busy. Of course, I didn't need to think twice about who I was going to invite. Cindy was the first name that came to mind, and when I told her about the tickets, she latched on to me and screamed happily. I guess she was just as excited as me about getting to be in the first batch of folks to experience this new haunted house. Fast forward a week later, we were getting in line. We were not the first to arrive, and the screams of agony and terror coming from the house were sending chills down my spine. I was super excited. There were about 10 people in front of us, and they let two or four people in at a time, just about every 20 minutes. The wait would be long, but... It was so worth it. I was surprised though. It wasn't much of a haunted house like I thought, but more like haunted woods. The house in question was an ordinary two-story house, obviously decorated to fit the Halloween theme, but it wasn't anything impressive. However, there were walls of black glass around the terrain, so I guess the pictures I saw on their Facebook were taken in this haunted forest part of the attraction. It was an interesting concept. The forest that night can be terrifying. Every cracking branch could be a monster, 
every rustling of leaves a ghoul on a branch waiting to fall on you. And so, even if the house part was shorter than expected, I hoped that the portion of the attraction happening in the forest would be worth the wait. As I pondered, another gut-wrenching scream tore through the atmosphere. All my doubts were washed away after that. I held Cindy's hand and gave a little squeeze and smiled excitedly at her. She seemed just as excited, if a little quieter than me about it. She was staring at the house in a mix of awe and apprehension, while I looked like a child about to make a razzia in a candy shop. Our turn came about an hour and a half later, but despite the long wait, I wasn't too disappointed. It was getting very late, and the darkness just added to the atmosphere. As we neared the house, I could feel the ground under me trembling. I wondered if there was something in the basement of that house that made the ground around it tremble, and if yes, I couldn't wait to see what it was. The guard at the door told us to follow the bloody handprints on the walls to get to the main office. The tour would start after we signed some papers. I was a bit confused as to why we had papers to sign, but followed the bloody handprints nonetheless. A man with his face covered in white powder waited for us in the office. There was a reaper on the wall behind him, and it looked incredibly authentic. The handle looked like a human spine that had been polished and waxed, and the blade was shiny and it looked sharp. The man was dressed like what you'd expect a cartoon death to look like, a black robe with a hoodie that only allowed us to see how white his face was. When I tried to look underneath the hood, his eyes were pure white, but his makeup around them was as dark and red as blood. The contrast was Terrific, and I took a mental note to buy white contacts for my next Halloween costume. I couldn't even tell where he was looking. When he told Cindy and me to sit down, his voice resonated within me, shaking something deep inside my chest. I felt cold, and instantly, all my senses went on alert. His voice sounded disembodied and had somewhat of an echo to it. It felt like it didn't come from him at all. He didn't seem to have a device around his mouth either, even though the sound came from that direction. I sat down, but I was almost bouncing in my seat. This was off to a great start. He explained that we had to sign some waivers, that the haunted site, as he called it, was not responsible for injuries or deaths related to being scared. It was basically a waiver that said if we had a heart attack or were so scared we fell and broke something, they weren't responsible for it. That by accepting to enter these grounds, we were prepared to get hurt, or worse, die of fright. I didn't think it was a legit waiver, and I thought it was more to add to the experience and build up the pressure. It was a good try though. Both Cindy and I signed the papers as we couldn't wait to get in on that business. We stood up, and the guy finally straightened himself so that we could see his whole face. His lips stretched in a sorry excuse of a smile. But once his lips were pursed enough to reveal teeth, both Cindy and I had a drawback reflex. His teeth were all rotten, crooked, and uneven. I saw a spider's leg in the crack of one and something resembling a worm was wiggling out of a hole where a tooth was missing. It looked so real, I felt my heart rise in my throat. Even the worm had this weird luster. The man wished us good luck as the door behind him opened, revealing the forest. Don't stray from the path, lest you want to get lost and subjected to more horrors. I only realized how hard Cindy was holding my hand the moment she let go of it, and my fingers started getting blood in them again. As the door closed behind us and we found ourselves in the forest, I took a deep breath and looked around us. The path wasn't very well lit. A few lanterns that are spaced in just the right way to allow five feet or so of total darkness in between them. Enough to see where to go, not enough to see where shit was hidden. It was perfect. They didn't even need to add music or a track or anything. They did, however, 
place a few speakers here and there for cracking branches, the hoot of a few owls, and the sound of bat wings and squeaks as they flew off. Cindy and I started walking, following the path. After about a minute or two, we felt like we were followed. Turning around fast, I barely had the time to see a woman in a red dress as she was disappearing in the dark of the night. Before I could try to figure out anything about her, a scream tore my gaze away from her disappearing form and in front of us. About four or five lanterns ahead of us was a woman. Her belly had been slashed open and her guts were slowly spilling to the ground. But that was not the most unsettling. Cindy screamed before I could say anything, but my blood turned to ice. It's her! It's her! Do you recognize her? It's her! Tell me I'm not crazy! The woman in front of us was a lady that was in the waiting line with us. Five feet seven, smelled like Chanel, curly black hair, simple gray jogging, and a white tee. She was about 25 years old and seemed to be accompanied by her girlfriend. I saw blood spilling out of her mouth and her knees buckling as she tried to take a step forward, while also trying to push back her guts inside her. She barely took two or three steps in our direction before her knees gave up, and she fell face first to the floor. I was shocked. My heart was pumping so fast and my brain was reeling. It had to be an illusion. It had to be fake. It was probably a super well done hologram or whatever it was. And I thought about how genius it was and how authentic it made the whole thing. Cindy was sobbing and holding on to me. So I turned toward her with a big smile, even though I could feel myself quaking. Every bone in my body was shaking and the adrenaline was pumping through my heart at 2,000 miles an hour. I was panting when I opened my mouth. It's fake, Cindy. It's freaking well done, but it's fake. Isn't that amazing? Cindy sobbed quietly and looked back at the corpse. It wasn't there anymore. She pulled on my arm twice and raised a shaky arm to point at the spot where the woman's body was lying a few seconds ago. All we could see now was blood. There was a bit of guts and a huge trail that led into the forest. <laughs> I told you it was fake. It took her a few more seconds to calm down, but I could tell from the way she kept walking stiffly that she wasn't over that shock yet. If that was only the beginning of the attraction, then I started to doubt her ability to finish it. If I saw any sign of health problems, though, I'd make sure to call for help. Maybe that's why we had waivers to sign. I didn't think Cindy would be so weak of heart, though. I thought as I tried to calm my own heart from bursting out of my chest. We kept walking following that path and eventually reached that fifth lantern. The ground was still soaked in blood, and even the air around the place had a tangy smell. I never really smelled a good amount of blood, so I imagined it was something like that. As we stared in disbelief at the pool of blood on the ground, Cindy whispered to me how real it looked. I thought she finally understood that in the end, this was just a scary attraction, and it was giving us exactly what we wanted. A good scare. I even had a chance of seeing a hint of a smile before out of nowhere, a scarecrow-looking thing snarled at us. He was tall and lanky. His hair was like a rat's nest and he smelled of soil, crusty pants, and cheap vodka. In his hand was a bloody machete that was still dripping with the fresh blood. We started running and screaming, but I was still blown away at the realism of it all. We thought we'd put some good distance between the scarecrow and us when we reached what looked like the end of the trail. There were big black glass panels, like the ones that were around the house in the beginning wasn't sure if we missed a turn or something. The guide did say not to leave the trail, unless we wanted to be subjected to more horror. And suddenly, the wind seemed to rise. A breeze so cold it chilled us to the bone as it passed, 
and a cracking noise started in the background. Heavy steps seemed to come from the forest on our left, forcing us to look in that direction. Something heavy was walking towards us. We heard chains rustling and something being dragged, low moaning and more branch cracking. The steps suddenly changed their direction and walked away from us. My heart was beating so loudly against my eardrums, it was deafening everything else around. I still could hear Cindy's heavy panting. She wasn't much of a runner, so I guessed she was still reeling from the previous run. Two lanterns away, we saw it. Its skin was a sick green and looked thick and scaly. Its head was devoid of hair and covered in blood-soaked bandages. Where there would have been eyes, there were only two big bloody spots with tears dripping and soaking the bandages. It turned towards us as it finally fully entered the path, and I saw what it was dragging. In its big green hand was a bunch of rusty chains. At the end of those chains were fish hooks that were stuck between the ribs of a poor girl, who looked exactly like the previous girl's friend. We heard a grunt and the beast took a step towards us and pulled the chain. I could see the way the skin and bones bent in that poor girl's body, and both Cindy and I took a step back. The moan that escaped the girl's mouth was terrifying for two reasons. One, it was muffled because her lips had been stitched with barbed wire, and two, because of how heavy and drawled it was. It felt real. Even that monster felt real. We backed up against the cold glass panel until we heard a door creaking on our right. It looked like an abandoned hunter's cabin. The monstrous creature stopped moving when we looked away. I was curious if it heard the noise too. A lantern was lit up next to the door, and the monster growled loudly, growled in a way that could only be described as otherworldly and inhuman, and we both decided to make a run for it, which was a good decision since, about a second later, we were chased by a monster who was dragging a screaming woman in chains. The sound of bones breaking and the beast's heavy steps fueled our escape, and we finally entered the cabin. There was only a trap in the basement, and Cindy hiccuped in fear, knowing it meant going underground. Even I had tears in my eyes at this point. I opened the trap just in time for us to enter and hide underneath. I could hear the monster's steps over our head. But the worst was when a thick, heavy, warm glob of blood dripped from a crack and right onto Cindy's shoulder. It smelled. I reeked, actually. And it looked and felt like blood. And so we dashed down the stairs, hoping not to fall on our faces. We had to find the walls and help ourselves with it for a solid three minutes. And I cannot tell you how many insects crawled on my hands, or how many disgusting things I felt along that wall. Surprisingly, for a cave underneath a cabin... It was insanely warm down there, so warm it made my clothes stick to my skin, and I had difficulties breathing. It was warm and humid, the kind of heat you can't like, and the smell was atrocious. It was a mix of sulfur and rot. I could feel Cindy's hands on my back as we followed the wall, and sometimes I felt like I was grabbing someone's head. The wall wasn't even and smooth. It looked like rocks, but sometimes there was a smooth feeling like skin, and at some point, I'm pretty sure I felt the nose and eyes. After about three more minutes of walking around, we reached an intersection, which was lit with one torch. Against my better judgment, I flashed it behind me to see the wall, and it was exactly how I was picturing it in my head. It was skulls. Decomposed heads, fresh bloody heads and limbs. I looked at my hands and they were covered in grime and blood and it smelled terrible. But it wasn't the time to worry. We had to choose between going left or right. We chose right because there was a pleasant breeze coming from that side, while the left side of that underground passage was vibrating and a lot warmer. 
and we should have chosen left. As we walked down the right path, we started to hear chanting. The murmurs were low, barely audible at first, but the more we got closer, the more we heard. I had no idea what the people were chanting, I had no idea what they were saying. It was in another tongue, but if I had to guess, it had to have been some sort of ritual. We neared the end of the tunnel I passed the torch to Cindy while making a shh sign. I pressed my fingers to my lips and crouched. I had a bad feeling in my stomach. In the distance, and about 30 feet ahead of me, was a small gathering of people. I want to say five or six guys dressed like the first man we had met in the office. There's a black robes, uh, white painted faces and all. In the middle was a woman in a red dress but she was also wearing a black cape and hoodie, which hid her face. I felt something sink in my stomach when I noticed she was standing by what looked like an old school operating table. There was a girl strapped to it, completely naked, and the skin from her forearms had been entirely peeled off. I had to put my hand in front of Cindy's mouth to prevent her from making any noise, and I saw that woman in the red dress use a scalpel and with infinite accuracy peel off the remaining skin of the woman's hand. I gasped, which I thought was quiet, small, and that perhaps no one would hear it. But then I saw the woman in the red dress raise her head and look at me. My blood turned to ice, and everything I'd witnessed tonight was replaying in my head. Suddenly, this place was where I was going to die if I didn't move the fuck away from here as fast as I could. And I heard Kira's laughter as I stood up. I grabbed Cindy's arm and dashed away from the ritual scene I'd bear witness to. I screamed at Cindy. It's her, it's Kira. As we reached the path, I wanted to go back toward the woods and hopefully lose myself in the forest but I could hear heavy steps and chains rustling in the distance. The growl forced me to turn at the intersection, left, where we should have gone first. I felt the ground vibrating under my feet, and the stench of blood and guts soon reached my nose. At the end of the pathway was a large, rusty-looking metal floor with big holes in it. It looked like a cheese grater, and some holes were big enough that I could fit my whole body inside one of them, but I really didn't want to do that. At the other end of that big metal floor was what looked like an exit. As we were about to step on the metal floor, we heard something fall heavily. The thump and squishing noise that followed disgusted me, and we realized quickly that the metal wasn't rusted. It was stained with blood. The couple that got in before us just fell from the ceiling and right on the metallic floor. They were obviously already dead, but when we looked up, we only had enough time to see a big trap closing. There was no time to waste. We ran across the metallic platform, or started to, when we felt the ground vibrate even more. On each opposite side of the room, the walls were closing in quickly. Behind us, the growling creature was approaching, and I could see flames emitting from the wall. I had to think fast. I grabbed Cindy's hand and we went on to the metallic platform. I picked a hole to fit in, but lost my grip and fell below in what was exactly what I thought I would find. A pool of blood and guts, crushed bones and torn skin. I screamed at Cindy to do the same, but, well, she badly evaluated the size of the hole. I heard, saw, and felt everything as the walls closed in on her and the couple, and their bodies were grated along the floor. I saw pieces and parts falling from the holes in the metallic floor, and emptied my stomach in a pile of guts by my side that looked exactly like that Olive Garden pasta I'd stolen from Kira. I felt tears rush down my blood-stained face. I moaned like I'd just suffered the biggest heartbreak in history. But as soon as the grinding stopped over my head, I forced both of my hands over my mouth. I heard high heels and saw through the cracks 
a woman in a red dress walking on the floor. The heavy steps followed, and I had to crouch in that pile of gores so that she, or they, wouldn't notice I was still alive. I hoped to everything good that no one would see me and held my breath for as long as I needed to. Clean that up and send the next couple. Danny, you said these guys cut it in front of you in the line of the grocery store? Well, let's give them the best Halloween of their life. Kira said and then everyone walked away. I didn't know how much time I had, but I knew for sure that I wouldn't wait to figure it out. When I was sure there wasn't anyone left, I climbed back from the hole I fell from. I cut my hand on the edge, but it didn't matter at that point. My whole body was numb yet shaking all over. I got out of that hole and heard a quiet beeping. Seconds later, there was a boiling hot shower falling on me. The water was so hot I was quite heavily burned as I reached the exit. I didn't feel a thing. I was in shock. When I reached the exit, I prayed I would get out of this place, but I was back in the forest. There weren't any lanterns this time, and so I ran for as long as my breath permitted me. And then I heard a car. I followed the sound and reached the road, then another car passed. I lost consciousness there, succumbing to my wounds and trauma. I woke up in a hospital room. A nurse told me I'd been out for two days and some bystanders brought me there. And the only times I woke up, I was screaming Kira's name.